good morning everyone and welcome to Defending Internet Accessible Systems, another webinar in our incident response series providing cybersecurity awareness and best practices. We're excited to be here today to present an introduction to the types of internet accessible systems and vulnerabilities they may experience. First, let's cover some logistical items before we get started. My name is Ashley, and I'm a senior instructional systems designer with over 15 years experience in the adult learning industry. My focus is primarily on building and evaluating training programs. Currently, I support the CISA training program by developing training content and facilitating training events such as this one. My co-facilitator today is Mike. He has over 20 years experience in cybersecurity. He's retired from the Air Force and has supported various DHS training and awareness programs over the past eight years. Mike, I just wanted to say thank you so much for your service. All right. Over the next hour, Mike and I will present an introduction and definitions for Internet Accessible Systems, or IAS, and explain the types of vulnerability indicators you can look for and discuss the impact that IAS attacks can have on business operations. In the second half of the webinar, we'll use the Identify, Mitigate, and Respond framework to explain how to identify one of these attacks, best practices to prevent and mitigate damage, and how to respond and recover in the event of an attack. We'll also present a series of case studies that will use real-world examples of Internet Accessible System attacks the impacts, and how the organizations responded to these attacks. We'll close the webinar with a few knowledge checks to reinforce what you learned. Finally, we'll close out our presentation with a summary of what we've presented to you all today and share with you some important resources you can use going forward. Upon completion of this webinar, you should be able to protect yourself and your organization from attacks within your Internet Accessible Systems through awareness of individual and organizational points of vulnerability. Our objectives today are to define Internet Accessible Systems, or IAS, vulnerabilities, present cyber hygiene best practices that prevent threat attempts from succeeding, explain the potential impacts of Internet Accessible System vulnerabilities and what an effective organizational response looks like, categorize the steps to identify, mitigate, and recover from attacks targeting IAS vulnerabilities, and explain the impact of attacks on IAS vulnerabilities through a series of real-world scenarios. So now I'm going to hand it over to my partner, Mike, who can explain for us what IAS actually means. Thanks, Ashley, and good morning, everyone. Um, so what is an Internet Accessible System? Uh, an Internet Accessible Information System is, is essentially any system that is globally accessible over the public Internet, or in other words, has a uh, a publicly routed IP address or a host name that resolves publicly in DNS to such an address. And this includes systems directly managed by an organization as, as well as those that are operated by a third party on an organization's behalf. And um, anyone in any organization that has applications or systems that connect to the internet and are accessible through the internet can be exploited by attacks targeting IAS. The, the interconnected nature of almost every modern day device or application, uh, or you know, in other words, the internet of things, right, um, provides a web of opportunity for cyber criminals to access and capture an organization's uh, virtual assets and proprietary data. So you know, that's the kind of the uh, textbook definition, but 
I'd like to have you share with us in the chat pod, if you can, um, go ahead and put some examples of uh, internet accessible systems that, that you might regularly use. Just start throwing them in there. Yep, the uh, the chat pod is going to start going crazy. Um, it's everything, right? I, I see uh, cameras, toaster. Exactly. If it if it's connected to the internet, yep, a light bulb. So so y'all got it. It's just about everything out there nowadays <clears throat> so so thank you everyone for for the responses all right let's let's break down the definition of IAS in terms of a typical network so so you can see how they relate and how you can identify systems that could potentially be vulnerable to outside attacks. At, at the center of, of this diagram um, on the screen is a port. A port is a communication endpoint. And within your network, you could have thousands of ports. Ports are, are numbered and uh, associated with with IP addresses, but not all of them are open to to the public internet. Now, typically, the ports that are open to the public internet um, include uh, ports 22, which is SSH, um, 80, uh, which is HTTP, and port 443 is uh, associated with HTTPS. Now, many attacks target these three ports um, because, because they are public facing, they are an attractive target for gaining access to a network, but uh, also following closely behind these popular targets are RDP and FTP ports. Are, are, those are also popular targets. Um, once, once you've identified the public facing ports, you should then identify what IAS systems are connected to those ports, which are typically going to be, you know, your hardware devices and, and the software systems on those devices. Um, good thing to do is to, you know, be aware of end of life systems that can potentially be a high risk. Because uh, those historically are, um, you know, most vulnerabilities are um, related to unsupported operating systems that can't receive patches or, or other security upgrades. Um, it's also important to pay attention to your data systems, such as data storage, uh, data shared databases, etc. And as you can you know, see here that IS 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 broad, so you want to make sure that you identify all all the relationships and and map out your attack surface. All right, over to you, Ashley. Thank you so much, Mike. So now I want to talk about IS vulnerabilities and how they're exploited. Cyber criminals scan internet accessible systems with intentions to compromise networks illegally. If a vulnerability is found and exploited, cyber criminals can remotely scan servers to determine vulnerabilities within the system. If a vulnerability is found and exploited, attackers can establish unauthorized access to system memory destroy or modify sensitive data, install malware, or take other actions to compromise the network and its data. 
cyber criminals can wreak havoc with an organization's website through structured query language injections, more commonly referred to as SQL injections. Uh, in the chat, just out of curiosity, has anyone ever heard of SQL injections before? By exploding this programming language, cyber criminals can instruct databases and systems to execute unauthorized commands on a business website. So yeah, unfortunately, we're all aware of SQL injections and the true nature of how dangerous they can be. So the United States Computer Emergency Readiness Team, or US CERT, has identified symptoms to include unusually slow network performance, such as opening files or accessing websites, inaccessibility of a specific website, inability to access any website, and the best way to identify an attack is to utilize unified threat management for intrusion detection and prevention capabilities and additional security features. So if you think about it, these are the symptoms you can use to identify if your internet accessible system has been compromised. John, I don't know about uh, the SQL injection, but <laughs> I've chosen to get vaccinated just in case. So next, I'm going to hand it over to Mike to talk about how you can mitigate Internet Accessible System vulnerabilities. All right. Um, yeah, here's some tips to protect the integrity, availability, and confidentiality of network systems. Um, or our best practices to mitigate IS vulnerabilities. And so they include um, hire a scanning service to scan all internet accessible IP addresses. Um, and if you do, ensure the scanning service provides at least weekly scanning results. Um, you can create and maintain an asset inventory of all such IPs belonging to your organization to establish a baseline. Um, you want to ensure that cyber criminals haven't already clandestinely set up another accessible port of entry and exit to retrieve information for malicious activities. Um, be aware of, of system privacy policies. Uh, then uh, secure your internet accessible systems with security programs and tools including uh, encryption and firewall software. And then last but not least, be sure to change passwords often. All right, it's, it's important to coordinate with system owners to remediate vulnerabilities in a timely manner. CISA, CISA recommends the following timelines to remediate the critical and high vulnerabilities detected on an agency's internet accessible systems. Um, critical vulnerability should be remediated within 15 calendar days of initial detection. And critical vulnerabilities, um, you know, the, the, they can allow attackers to take complete control of your, your web applications and web servers. And in exploiting this type of vulnerability, attackers could carry out a, a range of malicious acts, including but not limited to um, stealing information like user data, um, tricking users into supplying them with sensitive information like credit card details, or even uh, maybe defacing your website. High vulnerabilities, though, they should be remedi remediated within 30 calendar days of initial detection. With, with high vulnerabilities, attackers can view information about your system that helps them uh, find or exploit other vulnerabilities that enable them to, to take control of your website and access sensitive user and administrator information. Um, if you want more information on this, uh, you can refer to uh, Binding Operational Directive 1902, uh, BOD 1902, 
which is vulnerability remediation requirements for internet accessible systems. Thanks, Mike. So um, I see in the chat we're getting a lot of traffic in regards to other ways that you can mitigate your IIS vulnerabilities. And one thing that we didn't mention in this webinar, but we do discuss pretty thoroughly in our DNS webinar, is the importance of establishing multi-factor authentication. Um, is there anything you want to share about MFA and how that can be used in addition to changing your passwords often? Mike? Oh, sorry. Um, no worries. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, definitely. M uh, MFA is obviously, um, uh, you know, key. Um, staple for us nowadays with uh, security and accessing so um, but but no additional comments on that but definitely um, yeah Pat change your passwords and um, use MFA awesome thank you and uh, if anyone is interested we do have a uh, webinar that talks about that. Uh, you can find more information about our upcoming webinars and other training opportunities that we have on our CISO training site. So what do you do once the Internet Accessible System is compromised and how do you prevent it from happening again? Here are some remediation planning tips. The first is ask for help. You can contact CISA, the FBI, or the Secret Service for additional support and information. Work with an experienced cybersecurity advisor to help identify the extent of the damage and recover from the attack. Isolate the infected systems and phase your return to normal operations. And finally, and in addition to that, inform business stakeholders such as employees, customers, partners, and vendors through an assigned vulnerability coordination POC for your organization. Uh, in the chat, does anyone here currently have a vulnerability coordination POC that they're working with? Okay, great, Chris. Thank you so much. Awesome. Okay. <laughs> Matt, you're working on it? All right. So yeah, that is an important step in the process of mitigation uh, or recovering, excuse me, from an internet accessible system compromise. Also, you want to apply your business impact assessment findings to prioritize your recovery actions. And the way you can do that is by developing a response plan guide. So the response plan guide should establish a vulnerability coordination POC and align resources to address identified vulnerabilities detected on IAS is, and that's the only way, and that's only the beginning, and it's actually the most inexpensive aspect of vulnerability management. The next step is to implement a vulnerability and configuration management program to enforce consistent patch management across all hosts within the network environment. This should start with those systems that have critical or prioritized vulnerabilities discovered in the vulnerability scan. Does anyone here currently have a vulnerability and configuration management program? Okay, good. So when possible, it's important to remove end-of-life systems from your network. This is important because end-of-life systems may have vulnerabilities that can be addressed with the current, that can't, excuse me, that cannot be addressed with the current architecture of the organization's enterprise. So when you think about end-of-life systems, you also want to consider things like legacy systems um, or anything that or anything that may be out of date and needs to be updated. All right, so Mike, let's talk about some case studies. 
Yeah, thanks, Ashley. Um, yeah, so the the next um, part of um, what we're going to be showing you here, uh, presenting you with, is some some real world examples of internet accessible system attacks. Um, we'll talk about their impacts and and how the organizations um, responded to these attacks. So we got. Three, three case studies here. The first one, we'll talk about OPM, which is Office of Personnel Management. Um, second case study will be uh, University of Washington. And the last one will be um, ODS, Oklahoma Department of Securities. All right, so starting off with OPM here. The OPM data breach um, by hacker group named um, X1 and X2 is described as one of, the, one of the largest breaches of government data in the history of the United States. It took three years from the date of the initial breach for foreign intelligence services to formally catch the hacker group. Uh, that's a, uh, a long time. It was uh, low and slow. Um, so the OMB breach affected millions of people. During the breach, the cyber criminals were able to obtain the SF-86 forms used to conduct background investigations. And, and as you may or may not know, these forms contain uh, very sensitive and personal information. Additionally, they were also able to steal fingerprint data and highly classified IT system architecture information which they they use to move through the OPM network. So when OPM finally identified the breach, you know, they quickly worked to isolate the attackers. They were able to confine them to a part of the network that didn't have any pers personal data. At that point, they they then decided to allow the t attackers to remain there seemingly undetected um, to perform counterintelligence while planning their next move uh, so that they could remove the criminals from, from their network. Um, so what they were doing too was they were planning to do a system reset which would hopefully uh, exterminate them permanently. But unfortunately, uh, a year later, after the system reset, um, X2 continued to stay undetected to, and, and were able to install malware and create a backdoor to move, move through the environment. Um, security personnel eventually noticed the unusual activity on the network um, once again, but this time um, they Im implemented the two-factor authentication. Um, another thing to note is the, the government's U.S. CERT, um, the emergency team, helped to identify possible weaknesses in OPM's processes. Thank you so much, Mike. And um, if anyone is interested in learning more about the various case studies that we have provided, you can find links to them directly in the web links pod. So that's something that we wanted to share with you all for additional access. Now I want to talk about University of Washington because this is a pretty interesting case study. In 2018, UW detected a vulnerability on a website server that was open to the public. The internal files of protected health information was mistakenly placed on the public facing server by an employee, which led to a leak of medical records affecting approximately 974,000 patients. The employee error left the data exposed for only a few weeks from December 4th to December 26, 2018. So unfortunately, this is a great example of improper configuration settings, which can lead to a massive breach. Has anyone heard of this vulnerability breach before? 
Okay, yeah, I'll be honest, this one was kind of new to me, but, uh, you know, it's important to think about the steps that UW took after the fact. Upon identification and the analysis to confirm the number of patients impacted, the University of Washington took steps to mitigate the vulnerability by removing the exposed data from the site and attempted to remove save information from all unauthorized third-party sites. Because Google had saved some of the files. The UW medical staff worked with Google to remove the saved versions and prevent them from showing up in search results. They also made a, a statement of apology and stressed their action to review internal protocols and procedures to prevent future compromise. So this just goes to show just how important it is to secure your internet accessible systems and to double triple check the configurations that you have set up within your networks. Um, Mike, can you share another case study with us? Yeah, yeah, I'll touch on the the last one here. But yeah, admit, you know, this all makes me think of, you know, kind of like insider threat, right? There you got intentional intentional and you get unintentional um, and so some of those things like you know basic cyber hygiene doing those patches and keeping things secure is um, extremely important um, so for this one though um, Oklahoma Department of Securities in did I switch it I didn't switch it did I let me see here there you go um, in 20, 2018, a data storage server uh, belonging to Oklahoma Department of Securities was identified to be configured for public access. Um, the data was exposed via an unsecured rsync service. And rsync is a utility used to transfer and sync files between computers and storage drives across the network. So the storage server was left open for about a week, right? The vulnerability leaked millions of files containing PII, including social security numbers, uh, credentials, and communications and internal documents. It, it's uncertain how long the data was accessible over the public internet, but what this, this case study highlights here is the cyber risk as a result of misconfigurations on a network and that the exposure of system credentials um, also carries with it a, a high risk of a larger scale attack, right? So um, with this uh, attack, analysts initially identified the servers containing sensitive data because of the file size and file count as a cause for initial concern. Uh, and once they identified it, they, they quickly acted to mitigate the vulnerability and removed it from public access, preventing any further compromise. Um, what they did then is they hired a third party um, investigator to confirm the extent of the compromise and, and they reported it to the FBI. So yeah, that, that that was our three um, use cases there. Awesome, thank you so much, Mike. And I just wanted to point out a, a note that I saw in the chat that I thought was really profound. Um, let me see if I can find it. Let me see. Someone said, uh, to err is human, but to really screw things up, it takes a computer and a web server. So I totally agree with that. Um, and like I said, if you're interested in learning more about the various case studies that we used in today's presentation, you can find them or more information about them located in the web links pod above the chat window. And we're coming towards the close of our presentation. So now I wanted to take some time to go through some knowledge checks. 
We want to review the core concepts and takeaways from this webinar, so we'll present four questions and after each we will have some feedback that will go a little bit deeper into them. Just as a reminder, when the question is read, all you have to do is select your answer on the screen. There's no need to search for a submit button. After a few moments I will reveal the question answers so please follow along and see how you do all right so our first question let's see if everyone was paying attention uh, Robert you can change your answer it won't be locked in so our first question for you all today is what are characteristics of an internet accessible system? Okay, so we're getting some good feedback. Hmm. <laughs> Thank you to everyone who is also putting your answer in the chat. All right, so let me display our broadcast, our results. And the correct answer is applications accessed from public facing uh, from the public facing internet. So uh, you can think about it as you know we talked about this at the beginning about the various types of internet accessible systems versus the textbook answer so um, when we think about internet accessible systems one of the main characteristics is that it's an application that's accessed from the public facing internet so I know we think about like our secured intranet as possibly being an IAS, but it really is something that can be accessed through the public facing internet, typically with some form of an IP address that a hacker or an adversary can gain access to your internal network through a public facing internet. Um, so now let's go into our second knowledge check question and I agree with you Frederick anything is possible in the world of computers nowadays okay so the next question is which of the following are mitigations to protect your organization's IAS select all that apply Okay. All right. Awesome. So this, <laughs> Sylvan, I, I really appreciate your, your answer uh, that changing passwords don't actually help. So we, we do acknowledge that changing passwords frequently is valuable, but there are additional mitigations you can do to protect your organization's internet accessible systems. Um, so this was kind of a trick question because all of these things are mitigation steps that your organization can take to protect its IAS. Um, it's internet accessible systems but I want to ask you all oh Matthew this is a great comment it depends on all other policies and procedures regarding password management see NIST SP 800-63 B thank you so much so when we think about mitigations these things are all some of these things are really valuable steps that you can be taking to um, add protection to your internet accessible systems. Um, the other thing that I wanted to also highlight is the value and importance of removing end-of-life software. So 
Let's move into our next knowledge track question. But the other thing that I wanted to remind you all is that we do have an additional webinar where we talk about the importance and the value of internet accessible or of multi-factor authentication. So our next knowledge check question, once initial detection of a critical vulnerability occurs, when should you remediate? Okay. Okay. All right. So it looks like the majority of folks have answered. I'm going to broadcast the results now. And so ideally, you would like for it to be as soon as possible, right? But like we mentioned in the previous slides, if it's a critical vulnerability, you typically have within 15 calendar days to remediate the compromise or the vulnerability, excuse me. So now let's go to our next knowledge check. All right, so what is the importance of a business impact assessment? All right, okay, so it looks like the majority of people have selected their answer, so I'm going to broadcast the results now. So for those of you who selected B, you are correct. The most, one of the most important valuable elements of a business impact assessment is that it helps you prioritize your recovery actions like we mentioned in the previous slides. So it's important to think about the business impact assessment giving you kind of like a roadmap or a guide for which vulnerabilities you need to assess first. Oh, Carol, you figured it out. Exactly. So as a cybersecurity professional, it's important for you to understand how you're going to prioritize your recovery actions. And that is the value of the business impact statement or a business impact assessment. Excuse me. All right. So now I'm going to go back to our presentation. Thank you all so much. We really appreciate your um, engagement today. This has been so wonderful. Um, so now let's go into a quick summary of what we've learned. So thank you so much for your time this morning. Today we presented to you all a definition of internet accessible systems and the vulnerabilities that may exist. We explained various cyber hygiene best practices that prevent threat attempts from succeeding and discussed potential impacts of IAS exploits and what an effective organizational response looks like. Lastly, we presented various steps to identify, mitigate, and recover from internet accessible Inter recover from internet accessible system attacks. This concludes the IR 104 webinar on defending internet accessible systems. Thank you all so much for your time and we really, really appreciate uh, your information and your feedback.